the adverse publicity, the fact that the media jumped on this, the fact that pictures of young people in cages was now on the front page of the LA Times, the San Francisco paper, even made the New York Times, um, really created a sea shift in California, such that even the, the judges and the prosecutors could no longer conscience sending kids into this system. And pretty much it was, it was the, the coastal counties. Um, uh, we didn't penetrate the, the Central Valley too well. Uh, but all of a sudden what you started seeing was the LA district attorney stopped sending kids to the California Youth Authority. San Francisco has not committed a, a kid to the California Youth Authority in five years. In some cases, judges so outraged at what they heard would send their probation staff to go and eyeball every kid from their county who was in the system and to verify to the judge that these kids were safe, being taken care of, not being tortured. And again, torture, was, I would not use this word lightly uh, in, in terms of, of, of that. And in fact, if you don't believe me, read the reports of the Office of Inspector General that documented the torture of kids at several of these facilities uh, by, by staff. Um, and also there was a highly publicized beating of, 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 a, of, a, of a couple of young people at, at uh, the Tajurgian school uh, that was all over the internet. And, and so this, this sense that this was a really bad place that California should not be proud of um, grew around the state. And again, what you started seeing was prosecutors, mostly from the urban counties, starting to not send anybody more to the system. You know, coming up with options. Let's keep them locally. Let's send them to uh, George Jr. Republic, or let's send them to Pennsylvania, to that, I forget the name of that, that private place in, in, in outside of Philadelphia that people like. Uh, uh, but, but so different decisions were starting to be made. I'll never forget the chief prosecutor in Santa Clara, who's now a judge, saying to me, I'm a tough prosecutor, but I can't go to bed at night thinking that this is what's going on. You know, because no matter what these kids did, this is not, this shouldn't happen to them. Um, uh, the, the director of the Youth Authority during this period of time, Jerry Harper, had been a undersheriff in Los Angeles County and actually very influential in helping Los Angeles County with federal lawsuits. He came in, looked at this, and he was just outraged because he saw things that he had never seen in the LA County Jail, which is saying something. Uh, and so he even, while the lawsuit was underway, started, started changing the process. So again, the numbers continued to be tracking down Fewer and fewer admissions. I mean, in the California's got a population of about 35 million people. Last year, there were only 300 admissions to the California Youth Authority. So the numbers continue to track down um, during this period of time. Now, the bad news was that the uh, Central Valley continued to send, send to the system. And so nowadays, what you see is a lot of Latino youth from Central Valley, California, is in the system. You see very few African-American kids, which would shock people thinking about uh, this system. In fact, recently I was visiting one of the facilities where there's a lot of racial violence, and one of the black kids said to me, you know, Doc, there's no more Crips and Bloods anymore. It's just survival, because they're so outnumbered, you know, that they really are <laughs> got to do something different than they've been doing before. Um, the next thing that happened, again, through I think concerted effort on the part of, of advocates was to push for even further reforms of, the, of, of California sentencing process. And again, at this point, you know, I have to say to you, the governor was on board all the way. This was not the advocates against Arnold Schwarzenegger. This was us often working together, supporting the same kind of plan. So Schwarzenegger introduced a bill which basically would say that the Youth Authority could no longer take uh, any nonviolent offenders. Uh, so, all, so, so today, under California sentencing law, you can sentence a violent offender, you can sentence most sex offenders, but nobody else, no parole violators can, can return back to the system. Uh, no um, burglars, car thieves, drug dealers, all those people were kept out. 
and, and, in, and, and in something which I came to like a lot, basically the way Schwarzenegger approached it is he just said, we're just going to stop the flow into the front door. We will give the counties money to make you feel good, but we're not going to condition the money on programs or diversion or all the kind of community correction stuff that this field has been involved in because apparently his people correctly figured out that didn't work so well. So the simple notion was, we'll just give you some money, we'll distribute it more or less on a formula basis, which by the way got a lot of support, because if you were a county not sending people, it was a bonanza for you. <laughs> um, the other thing that was going on during this period was that the cost was skyrocketing, because as these facilities were closing, the state recognized that because of its arcane personnel rules, <coughs> It couldn't lay anybody off. So the traditional 35,000 a year to hold the youth in the California Youth Authority, which is the number we'd always lived with through the 90s, suddenly escalated to over 200,000 per kid per year. Today it's close to 250,000 per kid per year. So not only did you have the abuses, but you had this phenomenal fact that it was you know, four to five times more expensive to put a kid in the youth authority than to send him to Stanford. Uh, which again, outraged the public, you know, and, and people couldn't figure out, you know, how did that make any kind of sense? So the state turned around and said, well, we'll give you half of the money we spend, roughly 130,000 per kid, to take care of these kids. And so today, a little over 100 million gets distributed to the counties, basically as a payoff, for having to be responsible for these kids they used to send, but they can't send them any anymore. Um, and uh, a recent study by the prison law office looking at this bill, SB 81, which created this, uh, this uh, essentially found that it was working pretty well. You know, we found a few kids in detention that maybe were staying a little longer than they needed, waiting for a placement. Uh, by and large, it was interesting. What the counties did is they just pocketed the money. They'd take Mike Jacobson and they'd put him on probation. And he was just on, a, on, a, on let's say, a low caseload of probation, which they were already doing, but now they got 130000 extra dollars. So the California counties are rolling in money at the moment. And this money, because of, in part because of the lawsuit, is almost untouchable. So with all the cuts that are happening in California state government, uh, juvenile justice is not being touched at all. Uh, although we expect that some of the, there'll be some cutbacks in the juvenile system, but really not much. Uh, the other good aspect of the litigation was it kind of froze a level of service and care so that even if there were general cutbacks, for example, Department of Corrections has just basically eliminated all funding for rehabilitation and education in its prisons, but they won't touch it for the juvenile system. They really can't, because under the, uh, the, the, the consent decree, they probably couldn't get away with it. So this SB 81 just pushed the numbers down even further. And so again, at this point, the number is about 1,600, continuing to go downward. It's probably even a little lower than that. I can get into why it really is lower than that. Uh, and right now, there are a couple of pending bills that would push these numbers down even further. Um, uh, the, both of them, one of them will, will be signed by the governor, which basically mandates that, it used to be that a lot of the kids, as many as 40% of them, would just max out. They would leave at their, their upper term. Um, uh, this new bill requires that they be paroled 90 days in advance of their max out time. So that's going to result in a significant number of kids going out earlier. Uh, the other bill, which, is, which didn't go through this time, but probably will be passed next, next time, basically gives kids day-for-day -day credit if they participate in programs, and it essentially takes away from the staff the ability to add time with the exception of serious disciplinary infractions. No longer, I'm adding time because I don't like your attitude. Uh, that, that bill, AB 999, was close to being passed, didn't quite have, you know, the steam behind it, but, but we expect that's going to happen. Assuming the governor does sign the max out bill, 
and AB 999 passes, we could be looking at 800 people in this youth prison in the next year. So to just summarize, from almost 10,000 down to numbers that will be below 1,000, I would predict, next year. Uh, significant but not significant improvements in the operation of the existing facilities, although you know, a lot of us feel they could be doing better, but, but they've made some improvements. There's no question about that. Um, very tight court supervision, which, which helps a lot. Um, and again, think about this. Uh, no, pro no real programs. You know, no big foundation came in and plunked down millions of dollars to do, to do this. Uh, it, it, and, and, and it really does show how you can enlist, even though in a kind of ad hoc informal way, the support of the prosecutors and the judges in bringing about reform. Uh, and no particular implication that, you know, anybody's talking about reversing this. I can't even imagine it. The last thing I'd, I'd just tell you and I'd refer you, there's a wonderful group in San Francisco called the Center uh, for Juvenile and Criminal Justice. Um, and they've produced a couple of very interesting publications. One of them is a comparison between California and Texas, showing during the same period of time, whereas California experienced this dramatic decline in its population, the Texas population did go down, but not as dramatically, although now the Texas population actually is dropping rather dramatically. Um, and um, you know, showing that basically California experienced this huge crime drop, but Texas did not. So raising questions of, you know, what did Texas buy for its, you know, keeping its Texas Youth Commission open? Um, the other report they did, which is really fascinating, is California actually dramatically overbuilt its detention capacity. Uh, because of something of a cruel legislative joke, the legislative staff made California spend all of its federal prison money on juvenile facilities, not prisons. I think because they want to get back at the director of corrections. You know, it, was, it was not a high motive. But, but essentially, California added a lot of detention capacity, much of which is empty today. So there are several counties who are now facing the reality of, of ghost detention centers. Places, San Diego has an empty 400-bed facility. Most detention centers in California are substantially empty. And, and so even go, this has led, for example, a recent proposal on the part of what we have call our Little Hoover Commission to basically do away with the juvenile, state juvenile system altogether. Because they're basically saying, we got so much excess capacity in the counties, what do we need this for? Why don't we just you know, have five people in Sacramento who give grants to the counties to take the remaining kids and keep them in whatever county they're at? Um, and so, and that's very much on the table, you know, that they're going to be continuing conversations and discussions about that. Um, and again, with the closure of, of the Stark facility, they're really down to the place where they've got to start considering those. No plans to build in the, in the, in the uh, foreseeable future. And again, what I would suggest is what we've seen in California is the most dramatic deinstitutionalization of youthful offenders in American history with no adverse effect on crime, com counter to you know, what some people would say. By the way, the Wall Street Journal is about to put out a story on this where they're kind of saying, you know, this suggests that you can reduce the adult population too, because uh, you know, this certainly is a model of how, how to do it. And lots of lessons in terms of how advocacy, working together with the legislature, litigation you know, can kind of form a movement, uh, at least a kind of ad hoc movement, that has really transformed how California does business in juvenile justice. And I think it's a lesson for a lot of other states where people think this is so hard to do. Because again, if you think of a place where it's hard to do, there's no place harder than California and, and in, in so many respects. And I think the big unfinished agenda is going to be, well, I see two big issues I'd lay out there. One is we're still worrying a lot about the central valleys. I mean, you can imagine the disparity of the system now, uh, where killers in Richmond and Oakland are getting county time 
but still, you know, relatively minor violent offenders in the rural counties are, do are doing real serious time in the system. And the other issue which people are struggling with is mental health. Because even though the youth authority system is hardly ideal, it was something of a mental health system. You know, there were doctors and clinicians and psych techs, and there was some system in place, uh, now a pretty well-financed system. The counties have almost nothing. So what do you do with these seriously mentally ill kids? Uh, psychotic, uh, you name it, who are now rolling into these county facilities where they have even, you know, where they have nothing. And that's, you know, that's a struggle we're going through right now to try to figure out how to build in some, some new statutory protections for, the, for those kids. Now, I'd point out to you that some places, uh, uh, like Missouri, don't allow mentally ill kids in their state facilities at all. So a fairly simple solution would be to say, we're not going to do this anymore. You know, this is the job of the mental health department to, to handle these kids, and, but I think California's a long way from doing that. 